Hello, welcome to Stuff and Things Book Club, where I discuss a book with you. Hopefully you have read the book because I'm going to be going through the entire plot. We're going to be spoiling everything. It's not a review necessarily, it's a discussion about a book. And the book that we're going to be discussing today is All the Pretty Horses by Cormac McCarthy. I don't have the book in hand right now because I actually loaned it to my fiance and I don't know where she put it. She's not around right now. So we're going to be talking about All the Pretty Horses by Cormac McCarthy. This was published in 1992, and it's the first book in the Border Trilogy series. I had read No Country for Old Men, a little bit of Blood Meridian, and then also The Road by Cormac McCarthy. I had never read the Border Trilogy and I just started thinking, uh, you know, he, he died recently. He's widely considered one of the greatest modern American writers. And so I should delve into some more of his work. And I decided to pick up the Border Trilogy just because it seemed interesting. And I have to say, I was very impressed by All the Pretty Horses. If we go through a brief plot summary, courtesy of our good friends at Wikipedia, basically the novel tells the story of John Grady Cole. He's a 16-year-old who lives in San Angelo, Texas, and the year is 1949 when the story begins. He has been living on his family's ranch, raised for the most part by the Mexican employees of the ranch because he has an absent mother and a father who seems to be a bit emotionally damaged. The story starts off when his grandfather has died, and it appears that the ranch is going to be sold. Basically, his mother is now the owner of the ranch. She has no interest in running the ranch. She hasn't been living at the ranch. And for John Grady Cole, this is a huge traumatic event because this is his entire life. His whole life has been lived on this ranch and he feels this kinship with the work and especially with horses. He was born to ride horses, to interact with horses, to break horses. It seems as though he has kind of a mind meld with these horses. And so as the story progresses, he decides that, you know, after meeting with his mother, meeting with his father, his mother has no interest in running the ranch. She has no interest in letting him run the ranch. She says it basically doesn't even make any money. She's going to sell it. He's kind of at a loose end. He doesn't know what to do with himself. And he finally decides that he's going to go to Mexico and try to find work on a ranch down there. He enlists his friend Lacey Rollins to come with him. I'm assuming they're both the same age, 16 years old. And it's really interesting to just see this period, even though it's 1949, it's post-war, it still kind of straddles the old world and the new modern world. He is basically a cowboy. It's basically the kind of life that he's been living is sort of a 19th century life. And it seems as though he is very disturbed by the idea of giving up that life and having to kind of move into the modern age. So him and Lacey decide that they're going to leave. They gather some supplies, not a ton of supplies. They're going to be mostly living off the land. They have their horses and they start riding south. On the way south, they encounter a very strange boy named Jimmy Blevins, who is riding a horse that seems far too nice for a young boy like him to possess. They estimate that he's around 13 years old or so, even though he says he's older. He has kind of a weird, gruff exterior. He won't really tell them anything about his background. They assume that he stole the horse, and neither of them are super interested in having him along, but he just sort of attaches himself to the group. Lacey is particularly annoyed by Jimmy Blevins' presence. They cross over into Mexico, and shortly after a gigantic thunderstorm hits, Blevin is spooked by the thunder because he says that many of his family members were killed by lightning. So he freaks out, he abandons his horse, and during this whole process, his horse runs off. He's left half naked without a hat or boots or anything, and also loses his antique Colt pistol that was on the horse when it ran off. Blevins persuades John Grady and Rollins to go with him to the nearest town to see if he can find his horse and his gun. And they do find it there. It's being kept in sort of a broken down adobe building. But they have no way to prove that the horse is Blevins. And basically, Blevins wants to hatch a plot to go steal the horse back from whoever took it. 
This is all against uh, John Grady and Rollins' better judgment, but Blevins goes ahead and forces the issue. He steals the horse, and then they're all being pursued. They end up getting separated from Blevins, and most of the pursuers go off after him, and Grady Cole and Rollins continue towards where they think they may find some haciendas, some large ranches in Mexico. They eventually go further south, and they get to the Coahuila region, um, known as the Bolson de Cuatro Cienegas, and they find employment at a very large ranch. It's a beautiful, huge spread, um, and it seems like their dream come true. It's kind of that old life that they are pursuing, the life that is evaporating in the United States, still seems to be going strong in this region of Mexico. They present themselves at the ranch house, they are hired on, it helps that John Grady Cole is basically natively fluent in Spanish because he was raised by the Mexican employees of his grandfather's ranch. And he's quickly given a position of responsibility breaking horses that have been running around through the mountains basically in a feral state. And he has an amazing aptitude for this. And he really impresses the higher ups at the ranch. Rollins just becomes one of the normal vaqueros though he's helping John Grady break these horses as well. And there is also a young woman living at the ranch, or living at the hacienda, the daughter of the owner of the ranch, who is around John Grady Cole's same age, 16, catches her eye, he becomes enamored with her immediately. John's skill breaking the horses puts him in good favor with the owner of the ranch, and in this time he also pursues an affair with Alejandra against Lacey Rollins' better judgment because he thinks this is going to get them in a lot of trouble with the owner because the owner's obviously not going to want his daughter, who is very rich, highly educated, spends much of her time in Mexico City, going off with a fairly uneducated ranch hand without very many prospects, especially an American ranch hand without very many prospects. Alejandra's great aunt, who has become suspicious of John Grady's relationship with Alejandra, takes him aside and gives him a long speech about how important it is for a young Mexican woman of Alejandra's position to maintain her reputation and how badly her reputation could be besmirched by her associating with someone like John Grady Cole. There's a lot of stuff wrapped in with this, with the Mexican Revolution, um, which, you know, hadn't been over for very long by 1949. And they become more and more involved, Alejandra and John Grady Cole. He is basically completely in love with her. As John Grady and Alejandra become more intimately involved, a group of Mexican rangers visit the ranch, and they go to the ranch house and apparently speak with the owner. And they give Lacey Rollins and John Grady a good stare down as they ride by, but nothing happens. They were both assuming that perhaps they had come to arrest them. But as Alejandra goes back to Mexico City, John Grady decides that when she returns, he's going to make her admit her feelings for him, and he basically wants to marry her. He wants to go off with her and have a life with her. After waiting for her to return, he realizes by talking to another ranch hand that she has been back for quite some time and that she hasn't come to see him. And then a bit later, the rangers return and arrest Rollins and John Grady. They're brought to a horrible holding cell um, there's another older Mexican prison prisoner there. Blevins is also in custody. And they learn that Blevins had escaped from his pursuers, but then returned to the village looking for his Colt pistol. And in the process of finding his pistol and getting it back, he shot and killed a man. The three boys are interrogated and beaten. And then when they're in the process of being transported to a larger, more permanent prison facility, they take Blevins aside, the captain does, and shoot him dead summarily execute him. They're brought to this larger prison, and it is basically a hell on earth. These are two 16-year-old American boys, one of whom does speak uh, Spanish natively, but the other one doesn't really speak any Spanish at all. And the prison is just this free-for-all of some of the worst of the worst as far as violent offenders who constantly beat them, challenge them. Um, it's just this hard scrabble existence where it's almost impossible to survive. There is a man who has his own little kind of fabricated home in the middle of the yard. He seems to be important in the prison, even though he is also a prisoner. And this man takes them aside and offers his protection and basically hints that if they had money, and they're Americans, so obviously they must have money, 
that maybe he could get them out of their situation or maybe he could grease the skids a little bit for them. They try to explain to him that they don't really have any money and shortly after Rollins is severely wounded by an inmate with a knife and is taken out of the general population and John Grady doesn't see him again. And then after that, John Grady gets attacked by a knife-wielding cuchillero or cuchillero um, who nearly kills him but he manages to kill the man after he had bartered for a knife in the prison. He recovers for a long time from the near-fatal stabbing and finds that he's being released and that Rollins has also survived and is also being released. And they discover that Alejandra's aunt has interceded to free them but on the condition that Alejandra and him never see each other again. Rollins decides to return to the United States. They have some money that Alejandra's aunt had sent to them to help them get back to the U.S. But John Grady Cole decides that he has to go try to see Alejandra again. He manages to contact her on the phone and set up a meeting at a town where they spend a day together. He's basically trying his hardest to convince her to be with him. But she, in the end, decides that she has to respect her aunt's wishes and says that she can, she can no longer see him again. John is going to go back home, but then decides that he is going to go back and confront the captain who had imprisoned them to begin with. He wants his horse back, and he wants to enact a little bit of revenge. He does manage to kidnap the captain at gunpoint, he manages to get all three horses back, his, Blevins, and Lacey Rollins' horse. He's severely wounded in the process of doing all this. Um, he cauterizes the gunshot wound that he sustained by uh, burning the barrel of his pistol and then cauterizing the wound with that. He considers killing the captain but encounters a group of Mexicans who call themselves men of the country who take the captain as a prisoner. You're given to understand that there's some sort of vendetta they have against the captain. And he eventually returns to Texas and spends months trying to find the owner of Jim Blevin's horse. He gains legal possession of the horse in a court hearing where he recounts the entire story of his journey across the border and the judge later tries to absolve John Grady of any guilt, both for killing the prisoner who attacked him and for being unable to prevent Blevins from being murdered. And this happens later at the judge's home. Finally, John Grady briefly reunites with Rollins, returns his horse, and learns that his own father has died, something he had already kind of figured out. you given to understand that maybe his father has lung cancer or had lung cancer. And after watching the burial of one of his family's lifelong employees, a Mexican woman who had basically helped care for him when he was a little kid, the last strong link to the family and to his past, John Grady rides off into the West with Blevins' horse in tow. So this book has so much going on. It's obviously a coming of age story. Um, this is a 16 year old trying to find his place in the world and trying to hold on to a world that he feels is disappearing. And as I read the book, I, I loved the prose. I think Cormac McCarthy has amazing prose. He is extremely descriptive in his prose, but also kind of enigm enigmatic when he is describing things. The way he writes is interesting. There are no quote marks around any of the dialogue. There is often dialogue in Spanish that isn't translated. It's just there in Spanish. You're able to get the gist of everything for the most part. Um, I think I use Google Translate on a couple passages if I was unsure, but for the most part, you understand what's going on. And it really allows you to feel completely immersed in the world in which the story takes place. And it's such an interesting world. Like 1949, that's the modern age in the US. It's post-war. But in places like this, like in San Angelo, Texas, where John Grady Cole is from, and then especially across the border in Mexico, there is still one foot sort of in the 19th century. And in this world in which someone like John Grady Cole feels he belongs, a world maybe with more freedom, at least that's what he thinks in his own mind, but I guess he discovers throughout the course of the novel that maybe that was just an illusion, that's not really the case, and maybe this world he's looking for and trying desperately to hold on to, maybe it never existed to begin with, maybe it was just a fantasy in his own mind. His obsession and love for horses is constantly emphasized throughout the novel. He just feels at home with horses. He feels almost this kind of mind meld with the horses that he, um, the horses that he rides. There's the stallion that he breaks um, on the ranch in Mexico that he really feels a bond with. 
and it's almost kind of like an extension of his own spirit, his own soul. The romance with Alejandra is very interesting, obviously kind of a Romeo and Juliet sort of story, two star-crossed lovers from different spheres who shouldn't really be able to be together just because of their places in the world. Um, I think ultimately the book is about, it's bleak, a lot of things, a lot of horrible things happen to John Cole and to Lacey Rollins and obviously to Blevins, Blevins is killed. It's kind of hopeful at the same time though. And it's, I think a lot of it is about putting aside maybe idealistic childish ideas of how the world should work or how you would like the world to work and understanding that there are certain realities that you just have to deal with in life. So in some ways, maybe it's, dis it's depressing. It's coming to terms with your own disillusionment with the way the world is. It's understanding that as an adult, you come, to re you come to realize that things aren't going to adhere to the fantasy that you may have in your own brain. It paints kind of a bleak picture about just the way humans deal with one another. There are moments of kindness throughout the novel um, but there is a lot of brutality, a lot of just cold practicality in the decisions that people make. I think a lot of literature, a lot of art wants us to believe that love is the most important thing and that if two people love each other, no matter the circumstances, then they should be together. But through the way the aunt describes some of her history, the great aunt, Alejandra's great aunt, um, things that happened during the Mexican Re Revolution, the person she was in love with who was a Mexican revolutionary, you sort of understand that there are other considerations that you have to take into account and that maybe love isn't the most important thing or maybe love can't conquer all obstacles. So it's kind of playing with the myth of the West but also putting a cold, almost cynical, more postmodern eye on what all of that meant and dousing it all with kind of a cold rain of realism. It made me feel kind of unsettled when I finished it. I wasn't depressed at the end of it, and I definitely felt that the growth that the character of John Grady Cole goes through is really well represented. And I think that by the end of the novel, he has grown. He is basically an adult by the end of the novel. And I think he has some perspective on life. It doesn't have a happy ending. It doesn't have a good ending necessarily, but it just really tells you a lot about the human condition and human nature and our relationship with the world around us and the other animals in the world as well. I am going to be reading The Crossing after this, and I have a feeling that it's going to be much more grim than this novel was, but as the kind of opening salvo in the Border Trilogy, I was very, very intrigued the entire time I was reading it. I enjoyed it a lot the entire time I was reading it, and I'm really looking forward to the other books in the series. So that is All the Pretty Horses by Cormac McCarthy. Please let me know what you thought of this novel in the comment section below. And the next episode of Stuff and Things Book Club will be The Crossing by Cormac McCarthy. So go ahead and get that and read that if you haven't read it yet. So thank you so much for watching this edition of Stuff and Things Book Club. I've been your good friend Bradley. You've been the audience. This has been Stuff and Things. I'll see you later.